And it's 2 Corinthians, chapter 1. The first reading will be verses 1 to 11. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same suffering we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril. And he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. We're picking it up in uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially in our relations with you, with integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so, relying not on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. For we do not write to you anything you cannot read or understand. And I hope that as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us, just as we will boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. Because I was confident of this, I wanted to visit you first so that you might benefit twice. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and then to let you send me on my way to Judea. Was I fickle when I intended to do this? Or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say both yes, yes, and no, no? But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silas, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through the Amen, and so through him the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. I call God as my witness, and I stake my life on it, that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you, whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I have confidence in all of you, that you would all share my joy. For I wrote to you out of great distress and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. 
The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him, so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Well, do keep 1 Corinthians open. Um, we will, uh, I will be referring to some of uh, those verses as we uh, proceed. Now, we're, uh, uh, as has been mentioned, we stand this new series in 2 uh, Corinthians. Um, it's quite a long uh, letter. Um, it's some of it less familiar to us, perhaps, as some of that was being read. You thought, oh, I'm not sure I'm super familiar with some of these bits. What's going on? Um, and um, we're going to make quite... Um, uh, we're going to try and make progress through uh, 2 Corinthians. We're not going to spend a year looking at it or something and do two verses a week. Um, so we are going to take, uh, mostly it's going to be a chapter at a time. It's a little bit more than a chapter today. So there'll be things that we're not able to drill down into in, in great depth. But I'm hoping that we get a big overall picture of what's going on in the letter. And we're all also able to uh, get some really helpful things for our Christian life and walk. Uh, from uh, the letter. Now I've got a uh, picture here for us on the screen. Um, it's of, uh, uh, it's a, a painting, obviously not a photo, um, and it's of Oliver Cromwell, who uh, is a figure from British history. He ran the country uh, at a time when we'd got rid of the monarchy, we beheaded the king, and we had a few years without a king. Uh, and Oliver Cromwell was, was leading things. Um, and uh, there's a famous story behind this picture, you might know it. The artist, when he came to um, uh, get Oliver Cromwell to sit so he could do the picture, um, somehow tactfully tried to suggest to the person who was in charge of the whole nation uh, that he could, if he wanted, he could improve the portrait a little bit, make it a little bit better than it really was, um, Oliver Cromwell was fa famous for having a large hairy wart on his chin. You maybe can see it just under his bottom lip. A, a large hairy wart. And uh, he offered in the painting to remove it. The artist did. He said, I could, you know, I could just paint a normal chin. Um, and famously, um, uh, Cromwell said he wanted the painting, he wanted to be painted warts and all. And uh, that's now a saying in English, don't we? We have that as a uh, saying, meaning, uh, you know, we're, um, we want to see things in an authentic way, the way they really are, even if that means there's some unpleasant uh, things. There's a pimple on his forehead as well. Um, and um, uh, he was a normal bloke and, um, uh, well, I mean, he was running the nation. But, uh, I mean, in appearance, uh, fairly normal and wanted to be portrayed in that way. What's and all. Why am I telling you about that and showing you a picture of Cromwell? Well, it's because 2 Corinthians gives us a warts and all uh, picture of the early church and the um, ministry, life and work of the Apostle Paul. It's not a sort of uh, retouched photograph kind of version like they do with images of people that they're going to put on the front of a magazine or something. They've all been touched up on the computer, blemishes removed, and all that kind of thing. Um, it's much more a warts and all uh, picture. Uh, I've actually called this series, if you uh, pick up a term card later on your way out, uh, I've called this whole series, or each week, um, uh, the title of the talk starts with Authentic Christianity and, and then there's something we're going to find out about each week. So this time, uh, promises, we're going to see an important promise later on. But there's, uh, we're also going to be seeing as we go along authentic Christianity in glory, authentic Christianity in weakness, authentic Christianity in fear, authentic Christianity in hardship. You get the picture. So uh, we're going to be looking at um, some of these what and all things that we pick up from the interaction between the Apostle Paul and a church that he had started in a place called Corinth, which is in Greece. Um, 
We'll, uh, as we go on, we'll learn a little bit more about his interaction with them uh, that's gone on prior to this letter and uh, a little bit more about Corinth and what it's like and who's there. Uh, but I'm not going to spend a long time doing that right now, uh, but we'll pick that up as we go along in other weeks. So, um, what we're going to see here, and what I hope is helpful uh, for us, is we're going to see four reasons why God permits his people to suffer. So one of the warts and all things that we'll discover in uh, 2 Corinthians is there's been quite a bit of suffering going on. And we might think, people might be tempted to think, well if God's all powerful, if, um, if these people in the church or the Apostle Paul are his people, why is he allowing suffering to happen? Uh, the question of suffering is a big question just in uh, among humanity generally among religious people uh, specifically and it's also something for Christians to consider um, and uh, I think in this section we're going to be looking at we'll see four reasons I think there are more than four reasons but we'll see here four reasons why God permits his people uh, to suffer so we'll uh, we'll get cracking because we've got four things we're going to see so the first one is so we can comfort others so one reason that God allows uh, his people to suffer is so that we can comfort others. Have a look with me at one, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, so that was page 1259, uh, 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3. Um, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Uh, God is the, the, the God of all uh, comfort, father of compassion, he's described as. Now it's worth just thinking about this idea of comfort, because um, there's a few things that could be going on here, or there's a few things that could be behind that word, a few meanings that there could be. Um, it's not talking here really about soft pillows, you know, a warming drink, uh, a warm heater on, a full belly, things that we might think of that would make us comfortable. Um, uh, although uh, we often use the word comfort to uh, think in that way. I hope you've had a comfortable uh, time over Christmas and uh, you've enjoyed some of those things I've just mentioned. Uh, but comfort can also uh, be something we do to somebody who's distressed. We can comfort them, uh, perhaps uh, sharing some uh, words of comfort. Um, but it can also be to do with strengthening and supporting uh, people. It can be to do with enabling them to do something that otherwise they wouldn't be able to do. It can be a sort of teammates together kind of thing. A bit like this image is trying to portray uh, these people kind of standing uh, together. Uh, teammates can bring comfort. We can feel more comfortable when we're with uh, others who are supporting and helping us. Uh, you kind of missed uh, over the last year what's been going on um, uh, in Ukraine, uh, the terrible invasion, the terrible fighting that's going on, terrible for both sides. Um, and um, Ukraine have, have received a huge amount of support from other nations. I saw uh, just the other day that Morocco has now sent some support. It's the first African nation to send some support to Ukraine. So more and more nations are getting behind uh, Ukraine and helping them. There's one or two nations helping the Russians on their side as well. But, um, but, uh, but that help and support that's coming to Ukraine will be a comfort to them. Now people aren't sending them pillows and warming drinks, although there might be a bit of that going on. But the thing they really want is military uh, support. People have been sending um, generators and things which can keep the lights on and keep the heaters on uh, as well. But there's a great comfort to the Ukrainian people, I think, in knowing that others are standing with them and, uh, and providing practical uh, support, as well as kind of, we might say, moral support or encouragement. Imagine how much more comfort um, the Ukrainians would feel if the outcome of the conflict was known, if they knew 
definitely what the outcome would be. And when we think about comfort that comes from God, it's not that he provides us with fluffy pillows, but he does provide us with help and support, with teammates, with enabling, but also he tells us what the outcome of our suffering uh, is, where it's all heading, where um, we are going if we're his people. So there's a tremendous amount of comfort uh, that comes uh, from that. Now with that wider idea of comfort in mind, and not just thinking about a comfy armchair, with that wider idea of comfort in mind, let's read on verse uh, 4, Father of compassion, God of all comfort, verse 4, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So comfort for us, notice um, uh, for all, uh, it's uh, all our troubles, not just some of them. Comfort for us, but so that we can comfort others. But all of it, the comfort for us, the comfort for others, all of it, the source is God uh, ultimately. It's all from uh, God. It's not just for our relief that comfort comes, it's uh, to bless others. Now it's hard, but not impossible, to help others when they're in a situation you yourself haven't been through. Or to put it another way, it's easier to help people who are in a tough situation if you yourself have been uh, through that. So it's not impossible to offer comfort and help, uh, but it's perhaps easier if you know exactly what they're going uh, through. And uh, verse uh, 5 uh, says this, For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through uh, Christ. So there's a sense in which in our suffering we also uh, share with uh, or understand a little bit of what Christ uh, went through. Uh, the reverse, of course, is he totally understands anything we can face. He's been through uh, much worse. Um, and uh, verse 7 uh, says, um, our hope for you, he says to the Corinthians, is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. So um, uh, there's that expression, a, um, a burden shared is a burden halved, although sometimes it doesn't quite feel like that if you've shared with someone, it doesn't feel like it's been halved. But a sharing a burden, somebody uh, sharing with us in our suffering, uh, does bring uh, comfort, uh, real comfort. And uh, that applies uh, so much more uh, when it comes uh, to Christ. Now thinking about some practical examples of that, I was thinking about um, our church family and what I know has gone on within our church family over... Um, uh, over the years I've been here and there have been people in the church family who've uh, perhaps faced unemployment and there's been others in the church who've been unemployed before and been able to encourage them and help them. Uh, there's people in the church who um, perhaps have the heartache of having uh, an adult child who's not uh, living as a Christian and there are others in the church who've also uh, faced that and are able to uh, share um, and, and bring comfort and encouragement to each other in that. There's people who faced uh, miscarriage, there's pe people who faced uh, a cancer diagnosis. I could go on, there's a massive list of different things that people in the church have faced. And then being able to be equipped to share, to bring comfort, to bring support and encouragement to others, able to share their personal uh, story, to bring comfort, but not just some wise words, but actually being God's comfort and testimony of how God helped them in that. So that was our first reason why suffering might come, so we can comfort uh, others, but the, uh, the, the comfort is not just because we've been through it, but it's comfort that ultimately has come from God. Second uh, reason why suffering might uh, come, so we can trust God alone. I don't mean by that we can trust God on our own with no one else, because that's kind of the opposite of what we've just been saying in point one. But we can trust God alone and not put our trust in other things that will let us down. Um, now Paul has had it hard. He tells us that in verse 8. If you have a look at um, 
uh, verse uh, 8 with me, so that's halfway down um, that uh, first column of chapter 1. It says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. I mean, that is hard, isn't it? Despairing of life itself. That is uh, not just, or, you know, to, uh, some inconvenience when we, um, you know, misplaced our glasses or something. It's actually despairing of life itself. We get a little flavour of that uh, a, a few chapters on. If you keep a finger in uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and flick over to, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians 1 and flick over to uh, 2 Corinthians 6. Um, uh, so column 1 on page 1262, if you're using the Church Bible, um, you, you actually see there's a title there in the NIV, Paul's Hardships. Here's what it says from verse 3 onwards. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships and distress, in, bearing, uh, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. Um, uh, there's been some really hard things that Paul uh, has gone through, things that you wouldn't wish for yourself or wish on uh, uh, a fellow believer, I don't think. It has been hard. Uh, it has been a real a struggle. Uh, in verse, we won't turn to it, but in, in chapter 7, verse 5, he says that there's been struggles from the outside and also struggles within uh, as well. Um, so he's really been through it. Um, and um, at the start of verse 9, he says, Indeed, we felt like we'd received a sentence of death. So uh, we despaired of life itself. It, it almost felt like we'd been given a, a death sentence. Uh, why is all this happening? Why is all this happening? Well, he actually tells us, uh, if we read on in verse 9, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we've set our hope, and he will continue to deliver us. So it felt like they might die, but he says, but this happened uh, so that we could trust in God alone. Uh, God who raises the dead. Maybe they felt like they would received a death sentence, but God is the God who raises the dead. Uh, God is the God who delivered uh, them, has done it, and he says, will do it again. So that's the uh, second uh, reason why God allows suffering. It stops self-sufficiency. And I mean self-sufficiency in a sort of an unhelpful sense of thinking we don't need God, we can do it on our own, and we uh, can just uh, crack on. It's, um, it's a bit like if I asked you, do you pray before every journey you make in the car? Do you pray before every journey you make in the car? You might say to me, it depends who's driving to. Um, but uh, do you pray before every journey in the car? I think most of us that drive would say no. Uh, sometimes it's drip, jump in the car uh, and, and set off. Um, but if I asked you, would you pray if you're in the car, it's sliding on ice and you're heading towards a cliff edge? I think many of us think, I probably would pray at that point. I probably would. It might be that you know famous one word prayer. <laughs> Um, that, but, but, but I probably would pray I probably would pray but maybe not before every journey but I would pray then um, that, um, that uh, just I know it's a slightly glib uh, illustration but it just um, uh, we sort of assume everything will be fine don't we normally suddenly when the wheels are coming off maybe literally on the car suddenly we, uh, we, we turn to God we remember we do need help um, that we're not self-sufficient. Um, suffering coming into our lives is a thing that helps us remember that and learn that lesson. Okay, third thing. Uh, why uh, does uh, God allow suffering sometimes? So we can know partnership 
in prayer. Now this is something I've um, maybe not always uh, thought about uh, as much as um, uh, I have this week when I was looking at these uh, verses. But have a look again at verse 10. We've already read the first part of verse 10. He's delivered us from such a deadly peril. He will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. And then this is a bit, verse 11, as you help us by your prayers. So God's delivering them, but they're praying. Um, uh, uh, if we read on in verse 11, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour God granted us in answering the prayers of many. So for Paul, this partnership in prayer is vital. God does it, verse 10, God's doing the rescue, but, uh, but people have been praying and God's responding uh, to prayer. So, so Paul thinks that a partnership in prayer is vital. Um, Paul uh, understands it. They've been praying for him, so they understand it. Um, so for Paul, prayer matters. Prayer works. Prayer is something that happens, uh, can happen in partnership. Um, and uh, that means that prayer is a great privilege. Praying for um, brothers and sisters, maybe brothers and sisters we don't know, in other parts of the world who are going through a hard time, it's actually a privilege for us to do that. Um, we, um, we were praying for Open Doors earlier, and uh, if you don't know about Open Doors, it's a great organisation that shines a spotlight on what's going on for Christians in other parts of the world and gives prayer info. Uh, there's a prayer diary, there's probably some on the windowsill over there, there's a prayer diary they produce regularly that helps us to pray. Uh, but one of the countries often featured uh, or uh, talked about by Open Doors is the nation of Iran, as many other places it talks about. But in Iran, many uh, Christians have been put in prison uh, simply for being a Christian. Um, I would imagine if somehow a message came out from Iran to the UK, the United States, other places in the West that said, um, uh, for every Iranian Christian, who's in prison, if you can get, if you can raise a thousand pounds, let's say, a thousand pounds for each one, then they'll be released. A thousand pounds for each one. I think we'd have the money in an absolute flash, wouldn't we? If, uh, if there was some sort of mechanism by which you could pay a thousand pounds and a, a, a Christian who's been imprisoned in Iran can be freed from prison, um, I think the money would flow in. Now, I'm not aware of such a scheme, by the way, just in case you're thinking, where do I send the check? Um, I'm not aware of such a scheme. But imagine if, um, if we turn that from pounds into prayers. What if we said, you know, if, if, if we can have a thousand prayers for a Christian that they might be released from prison, they might be. Or they will be. Um, now, I can't guarantee that either. But, um, but that just gives you a, an idea, maybe, of how we uh, value pounds versus prayers. Uh, prayer can feel ineffective. It can feel a bit like just my little prayer for locked up Christians in Iran really make a, a difference. Does me reading the Open Doors magazine, finding out about what's going on in the world, does it really make much of a difference? Uh, Paul would say, yes, it does. And he would say in these verses, um, you helped us, verse 11, you helped us by your prayers. Many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in answer to the prayers of many. God has responded to their prayers. Well, that points us again to the priority of prayer, I think. And just an obvious takeaway from this is uh, make the most of the opportunities there are to pray. Um, we can pray on our own. Many uh, folk might do some sort of uh, daily little reading of the Bible or uh, prayer time uh, personally. Let me encourage you in that. It's a great thing to do. You might pray as a family, if you're in a family or a shared house or something. You might pray together. Great thing to do. Uh, we uh, always feature prayer in our Sunday morning gathering here. Uh, we were all, already able to pray earlier. Um, and that's something uh, that we're able to do together, isn't it? 
but we also have additional opportunities to pray, sometimes in growth groups, uh, but twice a month on a Sunday evening here at the church building, uh, we have uh, press supper, which is normally on the first Sunday. Uh, it's great to see, a great, there's a really good turnout uh, at that. Um, uh, often 50 folk across lots of ages coming together for bread and soup and also praying, uh, including praying for things close to home, but praying for brothers and sisters further afield as well. Uh, and then on the third Sunday of the month, and this is coming up next Sunday, we have something called Prayer Powerhouse. It's a little bit of a daft name, but it's to remind us that actually the sort of engine room of what's going on in Christian work is prayer. So um, uh, do consider if you can come along uh, to that. That's uh, actually next Sunday in the evening. We'll also share bread and wine uh, together at that. Well, there's a, a third reason uh, why suffering comes. We can know partnership in prayer. We can be stimulated to pray. Um, and uh, I've got a fourth and final one. And it's so we may claim God's Promises, or I was going to say about this, uh, we might know his faithfulness, but uh, we can claim his promise. Promises. Uh, God is a promise-keeping God. The Bible tells us He makes many promises, uh, often using the word covenant, in you know, a really serious promise in the Old Testament uh, with uh, His people. Then, and um, He is trustworthy. He is dependable. He is steady. He is uh, assured, he's faithful, we could say. And, and look with me at what uh, chapter 1 verse 18 uh, says. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silas and Timothy, is not yes and no. But in him it has always been Yes. What's going on here? As Kerry read that for us earlier, maybe think, what's going on? Oh, yes and no's and what's, get, what, what's happening? Um, well, there's been some questions, and we'll see this more as we go on. There's been some questions about the Apostle Paul. Part of the suffering is question marks that have been raised about Paul. And one question that seems to be being raised about him is his reliability. Is he reliable? And that's partly because he planned to come and then his plans had changed. And people are saying, well, we don't know. Is it, is, is it a yes? Is it a no? We don't know what's going on. What, what's going on? Uh, verse 23, he addresses this actually. He says, I call upon God as my witness and I stake my life on it. This is how serious he's wanting to say. Um, but uh, the reason he didn't come, it was in order to spare you that I didn't return to Corinth. He had some good reasons that they don't fully understand. Some good reasons for not coming. He talks about it a bit more. We can't go into that now. But the big point is that, um, or the bigger point is that he's trying to make is you might have questions about me, about yes or no, about my reliability or, or whatever. But don't mix into that, is God reliable? Can I trust God? Is he um, a, a promise keeping God? Is he faithful? Uh, so in verse 19, uh, as we've seen, he says, um, uh, in him, the answer is yes. Verse 20, he explains that a bit more. For no matter how many promises God has made, and he's thinking right back to the Old Testament, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. They are yes in Christ. He's talking about the fulfillment of all that God has talked about in the Old Testament. About the sending of a Messiah. About a rescue that would come. About how sin could be forgiven. About how a fresh start with God it is possible. How a new covenant is coming. All these things, all these things that God has promised and talked about in the Old Testament, they all get a big yes in Jesus Christ, he says. It's a bit like you can think of human history or God's dealings with people, a bit like in the shape of a giant, um, uh, I was going to say egg timer, what are those things sand runs through? An hourglass, yeah, an hourglass. That shape, she's also the shape of my wife, but um, that shape um, is, if you imagine, the narrow bit is when Jesus was on earth and all these promises are full. Funnel down, all yes in Jesus. And then all these blessings flow out from that. 
from that event, that uh, pivotal event in human history. It's all yes in Jesus. So Paul's saying, well, you might have some question marks over me, you know, is yes, no, what's going on? He said, don't have question marks about God. It's all yes in Jesus. This same promise keeping God also helps us to stand firm. Look at what he says in verse 21. Now is this God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ? There's no question marks over him. He helps us to stand. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us. He put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So he's talking about how uh, God for Christian people, uh, through Christ, has taken hold uh, of their lives. And he uses the image of uh, being sealed, like you put a wax seal on a letter in the olden days or whatever to show it was authentic, or sometimes on produce to show it hadn't been tampered with. You put a seal on there. Um, it's like an ownership seal from God on the life of the Christian. So, uh, suffering, uh, part of suffering might be that we see the failings of others that might cause some of the suffering. Um, the church in Corinth might have some doubts about Paul, and we'll go and see a bit more of that. Paul might have doubts about them, but the one thing they can trust is God and his promises and how they're fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So just wrapping uh, all of this up then, we've seen four reasons that suffering may be allowed. I've got a list of them, I think. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, so we can comfort others. So we can trust God alone. So we can know partnership in prayer. So we may claim God's promises. Know his faithfulness. Does this mean we should seek out suffering if it's got all these great things uh, attached to it? Should we seek out suffering? No. Um, does it mean we should be surprised if suffering comes our way? Well, no, we shouldn't be surprised because God might know that something that's hard coming into our lives is going to be helpful for us for these four reasons could he could have other reasons as well here's what 1 peter 4 says uh, thanks matthew uh, peter says dear friends do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you it's another reason uh, although it was something strange that's happening don't be surprised by suffering as if it's a strange thing but rejoice in so much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. There's that link between his suffering and our suffering again. So you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So part of being an authentic Christian is that uh, uh, the Christian life is what and all. What and all, just to come back full circle to where we started. There may well be hard things in the Christian life. Uh, be, being a Christian is not being off in some crowd cuckoo land of sort of not you know sort of false idea that everything's all perfect all the time. There will be difficult things, there will be troubling things, but God's given us tremendous resources um, to be able to cope uh, with that. And, and uh, my hope and prayer is that as we go on in two Corinthians, we're going to see that more and more. We'll see more and more uh, authentic Christianity and more and more of. Just the tremendous resources and help available uh, from God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this letter of 2 Corinthians. Uh, we thank you for all that we can learn and see and understand from it. Uh, Father, none of us like suffering or hardship. But we know that sometimes you allow that because uh, good things can come from it. Father, I just uh, continue to pray for uh, ourselves here in this church and other believers around the world who are uh, struggling at the moment, who are uh, in uh, hard places. Father, we pray that your comfort and encouragement will come to them. Uh, and Father, as in a moment we share bread and wine together, we just uh, remember the cross we remember the suffering and comfort that come together in uh, the cross of Jesus Christ. And we take encouragement from that. Amen.